we get in a coach bus, get in the coach bus and we follow the hearse up to the crematorium. And then we as a family are at the crematorium, tons of ovens, and then they put it in there and then they're, because the urn is only so big and the bones are big, so they have to, and they put it in, in order. So they start with the feet at the bottom of the urn and then they slowly build up until they get to the skull bone and the skull bone goes on top and then they crush it in there. Yeah. Special welcome to the TV show legend that at least I know nothing about. <laughs> Hopefully most people watching mm -hmm. are already familiar with your face. Maybe. Maybe your voice. Maybe. But I don't know. Who are you and uh, what brought you to Taiwan? <laughs> I am Katie. Uh, my Chinese name is Kai Di. I do theater. I am a Zhichang Ren. I'm from the US. I'm from the Seattle area. I was doing theater and also working at a place called the YMCA in America. The, the, that one? Yes, this, Wait, the same. M M C Yeah, YMCA. My job at my YMCA in the U.S. was I, I was the director of the summer camps. I did after school programs for high school students. And through my job at the YMCA, I started taking our members abroad, like travel for like two weeks for cultural tours. Cultural exchange is really valuable in creating um, relationships between people. I wanted to use more of that in my theater. And so I decided I needed to live abroad for a, a period of time to understand how to facilitate and how to build cultural exchange. And so I asked the YMCA if I could work abroad. I'm not Christian, but I, they're a really great organization. And I'm not a man either, but they're a great, <laughs> they're a great organization. But, but you're young. I, well, you're I young. was young at the time, not anymore. <laughs> the Taiwan one, it was a little bit longer. It was a year long thing and I decided to come. 22 years this month, 22 years later. Wow, you've been in Taiwan 22 years. I was in fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so they sent me to Yuanlin in Zhanghua. I was in Yuanlin for a year at the YMCA. I like Taiwan. I like living here. I'm just started learning the language. This is really cool. Zhanghua is beautiful. I was not ready to leave. And then I met my now partner. So I decided to stay. I continued at the YMCA and I worked at their company and then I moved in with her whole family. Well, speaking about cultural exchanges, that was like... <laughs> so there was like eight of us. Her mom mom and dad, her, her brother, his wife, and their three elementary school age children and me. And I lived there. No, 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 no offense to, to your partner's family, but it sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> to have a family here who cared about me and wanted to, you know, they fed me, took me in. I thought I was just the luckiest person on in Taiwan. And then a few years later, I started meeting some Westerners that were living in Yuanlin and they were all, you know, living in their own apartments. And they were like, you live with Taiwanese people? What is wrong with you? Don't they like, they don't let you drink? They don't let you, I'm sure they make you come home at 10 p.m. at night and I was like but I'm a night owl playing like the sims on my computer <laughs> so I don't need to be out partying and for those watching the sims is a very popular computer game 2001 <laughs> I mean, to this day, like they, they are my family. And I, you know, when I say I go home at Chinese New Year, I'm going home. I have a home to go to. I have family that relies on me and that I rely on. And I, it's, that relationship is so incredibly valuable to me. I wouldn't be here without that family. That's I'm, amazing though. Yeah, that's, it is. That's it's so cool. That that's a super super unique like <laughs> story. Because as you said, like most people or like most foreigners who come here, mm -hmm. they would even if they live in like Chonghua, they yeah. would still have like you know their apartment. Yeah. They will have their Western friends. Yeah. And yeah, like yeah. still like a little bit of a distance to the yeah the Taiwanese craziness. Two thousand one. So Chen Shui Bian had had been elected president for a year. Taiwan was like had been a democracy for like five years at that time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I. I tell Taiwanese people a lot actually. We really need to value the the government and the and the system that we have in Taiwan. There are are problems, there are going to be problems in any country system for sure. But the fact that from the 1990s to now we have gone through such a we have such a robust democracy here and it was all done peacefully. Like yes, I know like there were a lot of people that went through violent times and there were even deaths and stuff that on the road to democracy, but like there was no like violent 
revolution. There was no like war that happened that caused this democracy. The exchange was relatively peaceful. I, I mean, that just to me, that says everything about what Taiwanese people are and what Taiwan is. In some ways, we're so lucky to be here. To, I mean, to be part of the history that's going on, but also because it's just there's a kind of safety here that we sometimes we take for granted. I think we forget about it. And it's it's really kind of beautiful. And another beautiful thing that we should not take for granted is this dishwasher from Asku, who is also the sponsor of today's video. And the first thing you will notice, or I should say the first thing you will not notice, is actually the dishwasher itself. Since it in true Swedish design fashion completely blends into the overall bright and white kitchen. Secondly, once you've actually found the dishwasher, the second thing you will notice is just the overall premium quality and the premium materials used throughout this entire dishwasher. Specifically the steel used for the major parts which are in direct contact with both water and air throughout both the cleaning and drying process. And when I do say all the major parts, I am actually talking about all the major parts. We're talking about the overall internal body, the spray arms, connection pipes, electric heating tubes, loading racks and pretty much all other components inside of this dishwasher as well just to ensure the overall high quality and most importantly just like all other Asco products to ensure that the things just work as they're supposed to so you don't have to spend the time worrying about getting a repair, getting a replacement. Instead you can take that time and energy and focus on the things that really matters. As I mentioned, even the loading racks are made of steel, which prevents the creation of dangerous chemicals or toxins when you use high temperature water in, for example, other non-ASCO dishwashers with plastic loading racks. These steel racks will of course also never rust, age or crack by normal use. And since the rails for these loading racks are also made of strong steel, this dishwasher can take up to 26 kilos of dirty dishes in one single load. Now, I'm not going to go into full detail about how this dishwasher is actually cleaning the dishes because the short answer is that with Asco, you just don't have to worry about that since it just works every single time. But the slightly longer answer is that you can also customize exactly how this dishwasher is going to clean your dishes by using one of the seven different programs, including a speed mode, which is twice as fast as the standard mode, but which will use more and warmer water to get the same effect in shorter time. Or maybe the night mode which will run the machine more quiet by using a lower water pressure which is perfect at night if you're sleeping or if you want to run the machine while still enjoying a movie night in the same room. But regardless of which program you use to actually clean your dishes you will always enjoy Asco's turbo drying for drying the dishes. Which makes sure that your dishes are not only dry after the finished cycle but which also makes sure that the humid air and condensation from the cleaning process does not come back out into your kitchen. You see, the way this works is that the fan and the air channel where all this hot humid air goes is actually integrated within the walls and door of the machine itself. And the air channels will allow cold and dry air from the outside of the machine to mix together with the hot and humid air inside of the machine. This will create condensation which will drain down into the bottom sump and then the machine will push out the dry air instead before that door automatically opens to release any remaining warm air out from the machine. And in addition to all of this, and maybe my absolute favorite function about this machine is just how incredibly smooth and how easy all these loading racks actually are to pull in and out. And depending on your height of your dishes, you can actually very simply with just one motion change the height of this top rack so you can put even taller dishes down on the bottom rack if you prefer. And as if this was not enough, if you do prefer, you can actually remove this entire bottom drawer, put it on the counter and just put your dishes back into the shelves where they belong. And this is super easy and literally just rolls in to the machine as well. And if this is not an absolutely amazing example of the Swedish values and the Swedish design, which is aesthetically pleasing to look at, simple and functional, kind to the environment and of course have an outstanding quality then I don't know what is and if you want some more information please do not forget to click the link down in the description where you will go to Asus website and find all possible information you can possibly want about this machine and if you do want to check out this dishwasher in person then keep an eye out next time you visit a Taiwanese department store since they do have these showrooms and displays all over Taiwan and I also heard that they will have an amazing sale coming up soon as well and just as easy as this machine takes care of all my dishes we are now gonna super easily just jump back and then continue with this video 
right away. When you first came here, what was like the biggest challenge or the biggest difference between like your life back home in, in uh, Seattle? I remember one of the first kind of idiomatic phrases I learned from one of my friends was If you have good guanxi, if you have a good relationship with someone, then you don't have any problems. Taiwanese people are born with it. They're born with those relationships. You start with the relationships of your family. Then you go into class. People here have class reunions with their kindergarten classmates. Like, those are guanxi. But I feel like being being a foreigner in Changhua in 2001, I, I feel like entire Changhua would have a, a guanxi with you. When we get here, when we first get here, you hear people talking about you. And, and not saying bad things. They're not like, oh my god, look how ugly she is or anything like that. <laughs> But it's just like, you can know why Gorin, that's down like a nigga, nigga, Liolian, and sister mama. You just have way my mom, that's not some young mom. You hear them and you're just like, at that time, I was super hyper aware of like all the people looking at me, but I didn't know that that was something that I could use to make Guanxi. This YouTube channel is all about like interviewing like foreigners in Taiwan and comparing like different foreigners' lives yeah. in Taiwan. But you have by far had like the most Taiwanese life yeah. in Taiwan. Yeah. I'm saying growing up, but yeah. you were older like an adult when you came yeah, in. But yeah. like, you know, I, for, well, I was, like, hey, for the past I was two... 22, I was or <laughs> okay. 23, but okay. yeah, to, to me now at this age, I'm like, I was a kid. But okay, at the time, I thought I was an adult, yes. So half your life in Taiwan. Then. Yeah, ha literally half my life in Taiwan. What is like the most memorable, super unique foreign experience in a Taiwanese family? A week before I came to Taiwan, the first time, we had some training in at the YMCA in, in the US. The woman who was running the training, she was like, when you live in a foreign country, the two things, if you ever have the opportunity to do them, cannot miss these two things in any country you visit, going to a wedding and going to a funeral. She said those two things are so key to understanding culture. And nobody hopes that they can go to a funeral, but there was always kind of that like, hmm, I'm kind of curious. And, you know, I'd been kind of I'd been to like a friend's dad had died. And so I went to like pay my respects. But it's very different than being a family mm. going through the grief and the and the whole process of it can be like a month long thing. The last few years, we've had some deaths of close members in the family. The street in front of the house was cordoned off and they built a big tent so cars can't go through and it, the tent is there for like a, maybe one day or two days only it's not like a long time but there's a big tent and there's gigantic flower arrangement with a huge picture of the person who's mm -hmm. died and then there's seats and then everybody has to come in one by one and i call them flight attendants because there's two <sighs> <laughs> Two women, they're, they're dressed like flight attendants. They're like dressed in like skirts, like kind of pencil skirts and like a vest and they have gloves on their hands. And you walk up the, the aisle to where the flowers and the, the big picture are and you have to pay your respects. You have to grab some incense and there's a, like a fruit basket or something that they have to hold. The, the body is then put into uh, like the coffin because it's been kept in a refrigerated coffin for however long it's put into the coffin and then the young men of the family have to like put their something about their heads or their chins on the on the nails to nail the coffin in and then we have we crawl on the ground behind the coffin to get to take the coffin to the to the hearse to the funeral car that's going to take it to the crematorium so we crawl on the ground and take this coffin to the hearse and then we get in a coach bus get in the coach bus and we follow the hearse up to the crematorium and then we as a family are at the crematorium tons of ovens and i don't know about you as a european but me as an american we don't see this in america i don't i've never been crematorium is a a far off place. It could be in Oz for all I know. This is a thing that everybody goes to or the family, the close family goes to. And you wait for your turn. It's just like going to the bank. You get a number and you wait for your your dead loved one's turn to go in. And all the ovens have digital numbers above them. So you know when it's your turn. And then you go in front of the oven and the funeral director, who, there's a director that kind of is, is with you throughout the day tells you okay now you need to tell your loved one to leave the coffin 
and to go on because the body is going to be burned. So we have to say in in Taiwanese or Mandarin, like, okay, leave, go. We're going to burn the body now. Go. You need to leave. We love you. And then then the coffin gets put into the oven, and it takes like an hour, hour and a half for the body to burn down. And when it's done, take the slab out, and it's got all the bones on it. Like the bones have not totally become ash. There's a lot of ash there too, but there's still clear. Like you can see a skull bone. You can see, I don't know the different names of the bones. I'm not a doctor, but so they take that and then they put all those. They then they have like little、um, counters, I guess, kind of like like a bank counter. And there's a person、um, with a brush. Do with us next next time I go to the bank in Taiwan. <laughs> like this is going to be playing in my head. <laughs> Okay, I'm so sorry. Continue. <laughs> Then they have like a brush and they have like picks and stuff, and they start putting all the bones in here. They stand over there. The family, the fa- twenty、like、of the twenty fam- of us are watching it. I invite like the male,、uh, a male representative of the family to put the first piece of bone into the urn, and all of us are watching. And then, then that person continues and like fake teeth. They had like screws in their bones from like broken bones and stuff. Like they're picking, picking these parts out. And then they put it in there. And then they're because the urn is only so big and the bones are big, so they have to. And they put it in in order. So they start with the feet at the bottom of the urn, and then they slowly build up until they get to the skull bone. And the skull bone goes on top, and then they crush it in there. Yeah. Then, then they cover it up and they tape the lid on, and we take it back by bus to a temple and we pray at the temple. We went to the cemetery, we prayed at the cemetery, and then we burned the ghost money. I've never had a, a, a day like that day. I, I was exa- both both times that we did it. It was just exhausting. And you've been up since like three in the morning, two or three in the morning, and because you know you have to stay up all night to accompany them before the funeral. You have to like somebody's always. Next to the coffin, the day they die, until the funeral, there, there's constantly someone next to the coffin. They might be folding paper, they might be playing cards, they might be talking to the person. There's always someone there. So, 24 hours a day, there's it's, it's, people have to be awake and be caring for this dead loved one, and and the, it's the culmination. Like the that funeral day is just this day of just extreme exhaustion.、And、I was really grateful that it was exhausting because then it was just. You had to just kind of get it all out in one one blow, <laughs> but it was. I, I, and then the thing is, like my dog, <laughs> I have a pet dog. I had a pet dog. She died like a few months after this, and and I had to do it by myself because、um, my partner was out of the country. I had to take care of everything by myself. I took the dog up to a funeral place up in the mountains at Yamunsan. They did the same thing. And I was like, "Wow,、oh, thank God I participated in this funeral because、oh, I know,、man. like, I had to take the dog, and they put her in a box, and they, I, I had gave her a little ball to go with, and they put her in the oven, and I had to go burn the ghost money, and then come back after she was burned. It wasn't an hour and a half; it was like thirty minutes, and then I had to take her bones and put them in the urn, and then see the what, like the same thing with the dog. <laughs> That is." <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so, s- I'm speechless right now. <laughs> like, because this is the thing as well. Like, you know, there's there's no foreigner、mm. ever who will experience this. Well, I'm sure I'm not the first one, but it's、no, yeah, fir- but, but like, like, like foreigners like me. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah.、Uh, it's wild. It's it was wild. I agree with the person that told me if you go traveling abroad and you have the opportunity to go to a wedding and a funeral, do it because it's it really opens your eyes to how different culture can be. Let's, let's try to end this on a little <laughs> bit more positive note.、Um, have you been to a wedding in Taiwan? Oh, of course, yeah, lots、okay. of weddings. <laughs> They're not. They don't have a moment where they get married, right? Like this. Tell me about it. Like you're invited to a wedding. Like no, I'm invited to, a to like a hotel lobby dinner. Yeah, and, and the food usually not very good. <laughs> Just FYI, there's no dancing usually, but no dancing. But It, it's usually like like、uh, professional hosts. Yeah,、well. yeah. There's like the the MC has never met these people、yeah. before. Like they just had a script and it's、yeah. like the big lobster with a whole bunch of Japanese sweet mayonnaise on it and sprinkles. 
and uh, to be fair though I, that's like the, the pineapple shrimp that's like my favorite no that's like... that's horrendous <laughs> that is not acceptable at all now it sounds like you've actually been experiencing literally everything between <laughs> wedding and a funeral yeah. we heard an instruction by <laughs> YMCA yeah yes the YMCA you gotta listen to them um, <laughs> what's what's left for you in Taiwan and what do you uh, keep yourself busy with uh, these days I'm working on a podcast right now as a storytelling podcast and we're um, translating Taiwanese folk stories into English and then making them into radio plays. The Chinese ones have a little bit of English sprinkled in them and then the English ones have a little bit of Chinese sprinkled in them. You don't, you don't hate sprinkles in general then? Oh, no, <laughs> sprinkles are, they're vital. They're okay. a vital part of human life. Okay. But I, I just hate them on savory foods. <laughs> okay, I see. Okay. But on, but on sweet radio places, okay. Uh, yeah, on sweet radio plays, <laughs> they're awesome, okay? Another um, theater company that I'm in, I work very closely with is San Yu Shi, where the audience comes and tells their own stories. Performance group on stage hears the story and performs their story for them. Our shows are in Chinese. <laughs> so <laughs> so don't, don't be like, oh, I'm going to go see this and I'll understand everything if I don't speak Chinese. Where do we go? Where do we click um, if we want to see? I'm on Facebook. I have my fan page. It's called Tada, T-A-D-A. Tada. Tada. Song Yu Shi Ju. Instagram, I'm Teacher KTV. Teacher KTV. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Be, be, well, because... That's, that's good. That's good. Taiwanese speakers or Chinese speakers often mispronounce my name. They'll say it Kitty or Ketty. But everybody here can say KTV. <laughs> and KT is a lot closer to my name's pronunciation, Katie. So I always KTV. So I'm Katie and oh. then my V like this. And okay, now you ruined it. Now you ruined no, it. It was, it was great up until it's that point. It's memorable. But, every, but the, the problem with it is everybody's always like, so do you teach singing? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I like to sing, but I don't teach singing. I'm not a singing teacher. They're like, why are you a KTV teacher? I'm like, no, I'm just Katie. Katie with a V. And of course, you will have all the links down in the description as well to her uh, KTV uh, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram. And when that podcast comes out, you will find it down there as well. Yeah. Thank you all so much for watching. My name is Lucas. Starts with L as in like. Ends with S as in subscribe. Please to both. i see you all. In the next one. That is awesome. That is so terrible, but it's so awesome. You're not the only creative one here, okay? <laughs> Come on. That's that's where the bar is. That's yeah, where the bar is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said it pretty high. You said it pretty high, Ella's in like as in as in subscribe, Lucas. Yeah. yeah. The bar is literally six foot four. Well, I did not expect to talk about uh, funerals <laughs> today, but I didn't either. I didn't know I was going to be talking about funerals either, but no, it is. Normally, when I ask the question, what is the difference? People usually say like "chotofu." Yeah. <laughs> 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 well,